Hello everyone, today's lecture is going to cover recursion. Specifically, we're going to focus on the basics of recursion. The next video in the sequence is going to focus more on the advanced techniques of recursion and more on the nitty-gritty of recursion, whereas today's video we're just going to give a brief overview of recursion and then run through a couple of examples. So, to understand recursion, first we must understand recursion. You'll, you'll understand what I mean when we get later on into this lecture, but I want you to keep this in mind as we're learning about recursion, seeing these different kinds of examples. Um, this sentence might not make any sense at all right now, and that's completely understandable, but once, once you see a little bit about what recursion is, it'll make perfect sense. All right, so jokes aside, the formal definition of recursion is on screen right now. You know, it just says that recursion is a method of solving a problem in which the solution depends on splitting the problem into smaller solutions until a base case is found. Um, right now, that might go over your head. I know it did with me the first time I learned about recursion, but that's just like the formal definition. You look up a math book, you look up, you know, recursion in it, and this is what it's going to say. Now, I feel like it's useful for you guys to know this formal definition, but it's not super clear. It won't make a lot of sense till we start running through a couple of examples, but I still thought it was worthwhile to look at it. All right, so let's just forget about um, recursion for a second. Let's talk about factorials. So you guys might not know what a factorial is, so we'll just run through it real quick. So a factorial is kind of like a mathematical operation in which you take a number and then you multiply all of the numbers that go up to that number together, and that's your result. So for example, the factorial of 5 is just every number up to 5 starting at 1 multiplied together. So you can see that on screen. You can see that it's that the factorial of 5 is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is equal to 120. The factorial of 3 is 3 times 2 times 1, which is equal to 6, and then the factorial of 1 is just 1. Now, the factorial of 0 is equal to 1. Don't worry about it. It's a weird math thing. It, it has to be this way in order for some nice math stuff to work out. I think Wikipedia has a really nice explanation as to why this must be the case, but for our purposes, it doesn't really matter. So this is what factorial is. The, um, the symbol we use to denote factorial is just like a little exclamation point. Um, so, you know, like 3 exclamation point is just 3 factorial. 100 exclamation point is 100 factorial. So it's a very simple operation. Every single calculator can do this. Your phone could definitely do it. A scientific calculator can do it. A four-function calculator can't, um, but anything that you know is scientific and up can definitely do it. So let's let's really talk about this. Let's really focus into um, factorial. We're gonna cover. We're, we're gonna really focus on on this type of operation over the next few slides because it's gonna be really important when we um, go back to recursion in this lecture. So let's start up coding up the factorial function. Today I'm going to be using Visual Studio Code, um, but you can do this in Ripple or in Idle. Any other IDE should be just fine to do. Now let's start off just to make sure I have everything set up correctly. Let me just print out a hello world. I like to do this every time I start coding to make sure you know everything everything's working properly. Python 3 lecture code.py. All right, so we're good to go. Now let's make a function called factorial. So def, and let's just say um, fact, you know, just to not have to say factorial every single time. Now we said that factorial, you know, it was just so it was just like the multiplication of all the numbers up to that number. So the factorial of 5 is just, you know, 5 times. 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Um, we also said that there were some weird cases like 0 where that was just equal to 1 and stuff like that. But let's, let's just try to code up this general behavior. So let's take care of that 0 for now because um, it's just better that way. So let's just return 1 if you know the, the variable we're given, in this case n, is 0. Let's just return 1. Now if n is not equal to 0, then we could do the summing up thing. So now there's a bunch of different ways we could do this. Let's make a variable called result and uh, start off with a one. Because you know how if you multiply something by one, it just stays itself. So let's let's use one. Because if we were to use zero, then you know our result will always be zero. It doesn't matter what you multiply by zero, you're always just gonna get zero. So let's do that. And now let's make a while loop. Let's say that while um n is greater than um, zero. Let's go into the while loop. 
what we want to do is we want to multiply that n by our current result. So let's see what result gets result times n. And then let's decrement n. So let's say we give this function a um let's say we give this function a five. What's gonna happen is it's gonna check first, hey, is five equal to zero? It's not, so we don't go in here. We set result equal to one, and then while n is greater than zero, five is greater than zero, so we go into the, the while loop. We multiply five by one, that's five, and then we we de we decrement that five to four. Then we check again, is four greater than zero? It is, so now we multiply a result, which is currently five times four. So now the result is what, you know five times four, which is 20, but let's just keep it as five times four for now. And then we decrement n, which is four right now. We decrement it down to three, and then we check again, and you know three is still greater than zero. So we go in and then result times you know times n in this case is going to be 5 times 4 and then that's times 3 and then we just keep going all the way down a down a 1 so let's say that n is now 1 so we currently have um 5 4 3 2 in here and we just decremented it from 2 to 1 so it's 1 so we go up here and 1 is greater than 0 so we go in so now we do result gets result times n so 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 that's result currently and then we have our n down here, which decrements down to zero now. So we go back up to the while loop. n is not greater than zero anymore because it is zero. So we leave that while loop. And then what's in result should be the factorial, right? That makes sense to me. Let's see if that works. So let's do the factorial of five. We know that's 120. So let's see if that works. Let's see. Yeah, so 120. So we know the factorial of zero is um one because that's just part of the definition all right that works we know the factorial of one is just one yep factorial of two would be you know one times two so that's two so let's check that yep that's good and now let's do factorial of three um yep that's um factorial of three would be three times two times one so that also makes sense um now we could do bigger numbers like factorial of 10 if we wanted to and that's whatever that number is. I believe that's correct. Um, but yeah, so we, we just made a factorial um, function. It wasn't too complicated. Um, we had to be a bit careful because you have to keep in mind that this case was here. Like if we were to take this out, this code is not going to work anymore. It's going to, you know, give different numbers. Let's check that out. So it's going to be, um, well, actually, it might still work. Let me see. Yeah, it's still working because we're taking care of that by making sure that result starts at one and making sure n never becomes um zero but it's better to keep it on there for you know safekeeping just to be safe it's not hurting anyone being there and it's still a it provides an early exit to this function if you know n is zero um do you you're gonna see this type of um of you know case handling later on in this lecture and it'll make a lot more sense why i included it then but yeah, that's how you make a factorial function. So now let's let's talk a little bit more about factorial in the next follow in the next few slides. All right. So now that we know a little bit about factorial, and don't worry, we'll go into it more in depth in the next few slides. I still want to code it up. Now we know enough that we can code it up. We know the general behavior, and we know you know how factorial looks like. Now, as a challenge, I would like you to pause this video and try to code up factorial by yourself. Just make a factorial function that takes in a, a single variable, let's say, let's call it n. Um, n is gonna be a positive, you know, integer. So like one, two, three, four, five, um, technically zero as well, but don't worry about those for now. And just try to code it up yourself. Make it so that it um it just returns the factorial, fun the value at the end. So if I run that function with five, I want you to return whatever factorial five is at the end. Right, so on screen, I have a little cleaned up version of the factorial code we just wrote in case you want to reference it later on. So like I've been saying previously, we're going to take a closer look at factorial and we're going to be doing that now. Now, take a look on screen real quick. I have a bunch of factorial calculations listed. I have factorial of 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1 listed on screen. Um, so factorial of 5 is just 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. All right, that makes sense because the factorial, as we said before, is just the multiplication, the product of all the numbers starting from one all the way up to the number you're getting the factorial of. 
So factorial of 5 is simply 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5. You know, we start at 1, we end at 5. And then factorial of 4 follows the same logic, except it goes up to 4. You know, 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Factorial of 3 is then, you know, 3 times 2 times 1. Factorial of 2 is 2 times 1. And the factorial of 1 is just 1. Now, if you notice, if you look carefully at these calculations, you'll see a pattern. You'll see that the factorial of a number is just that number times the factorial of the next number. So, you know, the factorial of 5 is really just 5 times the factorial of 4. Because factorial of 5 is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And then factorial of 4 is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So we can just replace that 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 to a factorial of 4. And then we end up getting 5 times factorial of 4. And then if we look at factorial of 4, we notice that it's really 4 times factorial of 3. Right? Because factorial of 3 is 3 times 2 times 1. And then factorial of 4 is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So we can plug in factorial of 3 for that 3 times 2 times 1. So that allows us to do some pretty interesting things with factorial, especially in code. So now that we realize that, that relationship, we can talk about the second formal definition of factorial. It's not really a second separate de definition. It's really more of an alternate, another way of looking at the problem. So the first equation we have is really the formal, true mathematical definition of factorial. You know, the factorial of n, where n is any positive integer, is just n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, so on and so forth, up to 1. So if, you know, we have n equals 5, we have 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Right? That makes sense. However, we just saw that this relationship can be rewritten as, you know, factorial of n is just equal to n times factorial of n minus 1. Which is very useful, and this is what's leading us to today's topic. So swinging back to today's topic, in programming, recursion is just the process in which a function calls itself as part of its definition. So if we, if we look back to the to the alternate definition like the rewritten definition of um, factorial we see that that's kind of happening there you know to solve factorial you must solve a factorial as part of it you know n factorial is equal to n times the factorial of n minus one you know that is recursion right there and again you know I'm, I'm using the word recursion without really you know talking too in detail about it the thing is, recursion is a is a concept that's easier seen and done than ex than you know than explained. You'll get a much better understanding of recursion once you see it, um, compared to me telling you the mathematical definition of it, like we did earlier. You know that that came straight from you know a mathematical source, and you know it's kind of useless um, if you're not a super you know advanced mathematics person, but here we can see that factorial you know if this were like a you know a code you know function it would be calling itself as part of its definition you know because we have you know itself in the solution so let's roll with that a little bit now let's try to code up a recursive factorial let's try to put in everything we learned about that relationship that you know that factorial within the factorial relationship that we just saw and let's just try to do that in code alright so if you want to write factorial in the recursive way that we just saw we have to remember the recursive relationship right we know that the factorial of any number let's just call that n for now is equal to any number times the factorial of the number you know that comes before so again factorial of 5 is equal to 5 times factorial of 4 let's just write that down so that we we can see it more clearly um, and that's times factorial of 4 and then factorial of 4 is just um, 4 times factorial of 3 and so on and then we have to remember that there are some factorials that we instantly know the answer to so we know for sure that factorial of 1 is always 1. That's part of the definition. And we also know that factorial of 0 is 1 as well. These two stand apart from...
from all the other cases because these we don't have to do any calculation at all. They these are just these are just truths, you know. Everything is based off of these two. So let's roll with that for a second. Let's write a function. Let's call it fact rec for recursive, and we are still going to give it n. However, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have to check to make sure we don't have a zero and a one, because normally what we do is we take the number and then we multiply and then we take the factorial of the previous number. But if we have a one or a zero, we can't really do that. Factorial only works with negative num with positive numbers. So if you try to, you know, if you take zero and try to take the factorial of the number that comes before it, which would be negative nine, you can't really do that. So we have to put in a couple of cases here that catch these, um, these, um, you know, niche cases. So you know, if n equals one, we know that's just one. And if n equals zero we know that's also just one. So, so let's just save those, you know, let's save these cases for now. In recursion, these are called our base cases. Every recursive function must have at least one base case, but we'll get into that a bit later. Now is when the weird part starts. So if we're trying to get the factorial of a number and that number isn't one and it's not zero, that means we look here now. This is what we need to replicate in code. So let's try to do that. Let's return n times factorial rec of n minus 1. Now, this might have just blown your mind entirely because how is it possible that we are calling a function within itself? Like that's that that doesn't make sense, right? We are not even like how does it how does this know what it has to do? How does, you know, how can I, how can this reference itself within itself? Well, the really cool thing about, you know, Python and most programming languages is that this is more than possible. This is, you know, if anything, encouraged, like watch this, let's just run it so you can see. So let's do factorial of five. We know what that is. Let me make sure this looks correct. Yeah, this looks like it'll work. So let's run it now and it worked. So let's 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 look at it for a second because it is a bit confusing. So when we call that function with a five, what ends up happening is that we start off five is not equal to one, so we go ahead, we skip that. Five is not equal to zero, so we skip that. And now what we want to return because now we know that the factorial of five is equal to five times the factorial of four. So let's just return that, you know, we do five and then we return this. So what's going to happen is we're going to take N and then we're the, the compute, the, you know, Python is going to see this and be like, okay, I got to do this first. So it's going to call this again with four and it's going to keep repeating until it gets to one. When it gets to one, it's going to go in here and it's going to see that if N equals one, we return one. And then all of those calls are going to return their value. So it's going to end up behaving just like this. So if we have five factorial or that's just equal to five times four factorial, and then, you know, that ends up equal to four times three factorial. Well, that's just equal to four times three times two factorial, which is just equal to four times three times you know, times two times one factorial. Now we know that one factorial is just five, it's just one. So we can just, now we're done. And then this is just a simple multiplication. We can do that easily. So when we get to a factorial of one, then we end up doing this one. So that's just two. And then we end up doing this one. So that's just six. And then we end up doing this one. And that is, uh, let's see, that's 24. And then we end up doing this one, which is 120, and we are done. So with recursion, you're kind of solving the problem backwards, but you end up solving it very, very efficiently. Um, you end up solving it in a very elegant way. For example, this could have been, um, oh, this should be one, not zero. I apologize for that. Um, but you end up solving in a very elegant way. This function could have been condensed even more. For example, I could have written it like this. If n is less than two, which is the same as saying it's one or zero, 
then we um and this is going to be our um recursive call that's just the same i just bumped that down to a three line program whereas up here it was one two three four five six seven lines of code i went down from seven to three that's you know that's less than half you know so it is an extremely large amount of code size savings and this just makes sense this is just me copying the formal mathematical definition it is much easier to come up with this solution than it is with this one and you'll notice that is very common with recursion however at this point you might not be very familiar with recursion it, it might be starting to click but to make a click you just have to see a bunch of examples work through a bunch of them but once it clicks you're gonna be like man this is the easiest thing ever why don't we do everything in recursion and now that's just simply how we do you know a, a recursive factorial we're gonna be looking at a couple of different examples so you can see how recursion can be used in other types of mathematical um, relationships as well as you know real life um, coding applications all right so this is the recursive factorial function on screen in case you want to reference it later on all right so now that we saw a recursive example it'll be much m much easier to explain you know the parts of recursion the basics of recursion so as you saw, recursion and programming is just the act of a function calling itself. So a recursive function is just one that calls itself. Now, a recursive function must have the following. It must have at least one base case. It can have more, but it must have at least one. That base case is going to allow us to stop calling ourselves. Because if you don't have a base case, a recursive function is just going to call itself infinitely, forever, and it's just never going to end that base case provides us our exit without it you know would you just end up in an infinite loop pretty much a, a, an, an endless you know line of recursive calls and it must also have a useful call to itself when i say useful you must change the parameters every time you can't just keep the parameters the same because if you do you're just gonna stay in the same place it's also going to be an infinite line of recursive calls they're just going to be the same each one so you must make sure that these two um, things are present in your recursive call. Otherwise, you don't have a recursive call. You just have a, a, res a recipe for, um, for an infinite line of you know, recursive calls. You don't have a recursive function. You just have something that's going to crash your computer or your program or whatever it is um, the function is running on. To illustrate just how important the base case and the, recurs the useful recursive call is, in um, recursive function I'm just gonna we're gonna go back to the factorial and we're just gonna remove those so let's remove the base case right now let's remove it right because if you look at it this makes sense right you know we this this looks like it should work because that is what a factorial is a factorial is just n times factorial of n minus 1 I, I just said that right I just said that um let me write it again down here factorial of n is just n times you know factorial of n minus 1. This is literally what I have written here. So let's just try to do it. Let's just let's just try it and see what happens. And we got an error. So in Python, if you try to go down an endless pit of recursion, you're going to get this error. Max, maximum recursion depth exceeded. Now this is just an error that stops you from, you know, damaging something or just you know from a program running forever um it's just like python's way of making sure you don't have an, a, a program that is just stuck doing the same thing over and over again without a without an exit you can disable this if you want to but you shouldn't you this this is good because this caught an error in the code that is not a is not a syntax error like there is no mistake here nothing's misspelled I'm not using the wrong keywords this is completely valid code it's just working in a very unexpected and unintended way because what ends up happening is we have factorial of 5 well let's start with a smaller number so it's quicker so we, let's say we have factorial of 3 well we know that factorial of 3 is equal to 3 times factorial of 2 right and then when we get to factorial of 2 well we know that that is going to be equal to you know two times factorial of one yes we know that so when we get down to here we know that you know we're going to return that one factorial of one is equal to you know factorial of zero 
still technically correct. But then when we go back in again, we get to factor of zero. And what that, is that says is that it's zero times factorial of negative one, which is just, com this doesn't make sense. You can't have factorial with negative numbers. But us having removed that base case is gonna lead to this behavior. So now let's bring that base case back and run it again. You know, and now it's working the way we expect it to. Now, what if we mess up our recursive call? What if we forget to change our n? What's going to happen then? Well, let's try it. And we got the same error. So we did an pretty much infinite recursive calls, and Python's like, no, 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 you can't do that. Sorry, let me stop you right there, sir. Um, that's pretty much what just happened. Now, let's just run through it. So according to our recursive call, our, our factorial, if we start of if, if we start of um, factorial of three, we go in, so three is not less than two, so the base case doesn't catch us, and then we do a recursive call, which is three times factorial of three. Okay, got it. Now, that's gonna be equal to, let's go back in again, you know, three is still, you know, that's not smaller than two, so we don't go in our base case. And then we, we say that, you know, factorial of three is just equal to three times factorial of three. So, okay, I see where we're going with this, and then that's just going to repeat forever. So this is why you must have a useful base case and a useful recursive call. You must have at least one of each. You can have multiple recursive calls sprinkled throughout the program. Maybe you want to do slightly different recursive calls based on the case you're currently in. Maybe there's multiple different base cases, but you must have at least one of each, and they must be useful for your function to be a recursive function and for it to even work in the first place. All right, so now that we learned the, the bare bones basics of recursion, let's look at a couple of recursive applications. So first up, it's Fibonacci. Now you probably heard of you know the Fibonacci sequence, um, but if you haven't, it's, it's on screen. So it just looks like it's just a sequence of numbers that follows a specific pattern. So the sequence starts like this. It starts with zero and one, and then 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, and so on infinitely. It's a never-ending sequence. And the Fibonacci number is really cool. It appears in nature and has a bunch of real-life applications. And there's, there's a lot of relationship between these numbers. Like that picture that's on screen, that's just showcasing a curve that naturally forms. It's called the golden ratio, I believe. That show that follows if you make squares in which the width of each square is equal to the to a Fibonacci number. So first off, you start with a square with a with a width of zero. So that's just like a point. You know, it just doesn't exist. And then you make a uh, a square with a width of one. That's just a one by one. And then uh the next to that you make a square with a one by one as well. And then the next Fibonacci number is 2, so you make a square with a width of 2, so that's a 2 by 2. The next one's 3, so you make a square that is a 3 by 3. Then 5 is up, so a 5 by 5. And then if you go around like the, the, the little intersections, you end up with that really cool curve. And that curve shows up everywhere. Like in nature, it shows up in flowers and shows up in like seashells. And like a snail's, you know, shell, it also shows up. It's a very, very interesting concept that has a lot of applications and it's so useful that you know in nature it appears which is pretty cool but now let's take a closer look at the Fibonacci sequence so the definition of the Fibonacci sequence is that the first two numbers are always 0 and 1 so the zeroth number of the Fibonacci sequence you know fib 0 that's equal to 0 always and the first number of the Fibonacci sequence is 1 so fib 0 is 0 and the fib 1 is 1 and then any other Fibonacci number is just the sum of the previous two numbers so Fibonacci of 2 is just Fibonacci of 1 plus Fibonacci of 0 and the Fibonacci of 3 is just Fibonacci of 2 plus Fibonacci of 1 and the Fibonacci of 5 is just Fibonacci of 4 plus Fibonacci of 3 and we can see that in the sequence for example if we go back a slide real quick you can see that let me get the laser pointer that the first two numbers are 0 and 1, and then the, th the third number is just the sum of the previous two. So 0 plus 1, that's 1. So that's a third Fibonacci number. Then the fourth Fibonacci number is just the sum of the previous two. So 1 plus 1, that's 2. And the next one is 3 because it's, you know, 1 plus 2. So that's 3. 
Next one up is 5 because the last two are 2 and 3 and their sum is 5. Next one's 8 because 3 plus 8, I mean 3 plus 5 is 8 and so on. So the number that would go here, you know, after 21 would be 13 plus 21. So that would be the number that would go here and then it goes that goes, you know, infinitely forever. Now, that gives us a lot of information. So let's just go and try to sum all of that up. Let me put this uh, laser pointer away. So this is the important part of what we just learned. That there are two base cases for the Fibonacci sequence. These are part of its definition. We know that Fib of 0 is 0 and Fib of 1 is 1. And we know that every other number in the Fibonacci sequence follows this pattern. It's just the sum of the last two numbers. Now, does this look familiar? Like, this looks a lot like the discussion we just had about um, factorials, right? So, you, you're, you probably know where this is headed. Now we get to code it up. Now, again, as a challenge, I think it would be really useful if you just pause the video right now and try to code this up yourself. It really is as easy as looking at the base case and the, you know, the recursive case, quote unquote, that we just saw and just coding it up. So I want you to try that real quick, you know, pause the video. And then once you're done or if you run into any issues then come back to this video and see how I solved it. All right. So let's write a, um, a Fibonacci sequence function that's um, recursive. So let's start with um, fib. I just call it fib of n because this function, all it's going to return is the nth Fibonacci number. So let's start off with our base cases. Every recursive function must have base cases. So base cases. And now if n equals 0, then we just return 0. And then if n equals, yeah, if n equals 1, then we just return one. Now this can be condensed. We could do like if n is less than two, then return n. That'll also work, but let's not worry too much about that. That'll just make it a bit um, too complex. It's still a very simple thing, but this lays out the logic very clearly. So now if it's not one of these cases, now is when we do our sick recursion. Now, as we said earlier, Fib the Fibonacci sequence is like this. Fibonacci of n is just Fibonacci of n minus 1 plus Fibonacci of n minus 2. With the exception that Fibonacci of 0 equals 0 and Fibonacci of 1 equals 1. So if we get like Fibonacci of 3, we're going to get something else. So, you know, it's going to start like this. Let me. And then it's going to do 1 and then 2 and then the last two are sum. So that's um, 3 and then that's 5 and then that's going to be 8. And then that, what is that? That's 13 and then that's 21 and so on and so forth. Let me make sure I did that right. 0, 1. Some of those is 1. Some of these is 2. Some of these is 3. Some of these is 5. 3 plus 5 is 8. And then 13 and then 21. Okay, that looks right. So now we have to do the recursive case. Now, if we look at this, this is the zeroth number of the Fibonacci um, sequence. This is the first number, second number, third number, fourth number, fifth number, sixth number, seventh number, eighth number. You know, let me, um, let me, you know, do this so that we can easily, you know, see what's going on. So 21 is going to be the eighth Fibonacci number. So this is just so we can reference it earlier when we start doing tests. So let's return now because this is going to be our recursive call. So let me comment that out. Recursive calls. And we're going to return Fibonacci of n minus 1 plus Fibonacci of n minus 2. Now we have two recursive calls, which is fine. Um, we'll go into a little bit later the implication of having two recursive calls, but there's nothing syntactically like wrong with this. So let's just try it. Let's do Fibonacci of, uh, let's do Fibonacci of zero to make sure our base cases work. Okay, Fibonacci of zero is zero. Yeah, that makes sense. And then let's do Fibonacci of one. Okay, yep, yeah, that makes sense. And then Fibonacci of two. 
Yep, that makes sense. And then Fibonacci of uh, let's do eight. 21 which corresponds to what we wanted so yeah that that makes perfect sense this was an extremely um, simple example and you can see how from the relationship from the definition of the Fibonacci sequence we could literally code it up almost word for word it was a the code looks exactly like the definition which is pretty cool so that's how you code up Fibonacci recursively so on screen, you're going to see the Fibonacci recursive solution in case you want to reference it later on. Now, we got to talk a little bit about how the Fibonacci recursive relationship works. So let's say on screen we have um, what happens when you call Fibonacci of 5. So let me use the pen. So when we call Fibonacci of 5, you end up with the following. So you got to do Fibonacci of 4 plus Fibonacci of 3 which is here so since Fibonacci of 4 is here first we got to do that so we go down this trail first and we got to calculate Fibonacci of 4 and we know that Fibonacci of 4 is Fibonacci of 3 plus Fibonacci of 2 so we got to go down Fibonacci of 3 because that's first and then we know that Fibonacci of 3 is Fibonacci of 2 plus Fibonacci of 1 so we got to do Fibonacci of 2 first because you know we, we wrote it first and then we know that Fibonacci of 2 is just Fibonacci of 1 plus Fibonacci of 0. And now we know that Fibonacci of 1, we're going to do that one first, is 1. So we just, you know, we just can, we can just write 1 here. So now we go back up, and now we do Fibonacci of 0. We know that's 0, so that's good. And now we know that Fibonacci of 2 is 1 plus 0, so it's just 1. And now we go up to Fibonacci of 3. However, we haven't done the second Fibonacci call for Fibonacci of 3, so we got to go down here and do Fibonacci of 1. Oh, I forgot that arrow here. And this goes up, and then this goes up, and this goes up. Then we know that's 1, so now we can go back up. And once we go back up, we know that it's 1 plus 1, so that's going to be 2. And now we're at Fibonacci of 4. But we've only done Fibonacci of 3 for this Fibonacci of 4, so we still have to do that Fibonacci of 2. So we have to go down there, and we know that Fibonacci of 2 is equal to Fibonacci of 1 plus Fibonacci of 0, so we have to go down to Fibonacci of 1. That's 1. So let's, oh, I keep forgetting my arrows, and then this goes back up. And now we go back up here, but we still have to do the other one, so we go down to Fibonacci of 0. And we go back up, and now we know Fibonacci of 2. So that's 1. So now we're going to go back up to Fibonacci of 4. And we know that Fibonacci of 4 is 2 plus 1. So that's going to be 3. And now we're back up to Fibonacci of 5. But there's still an entire half of the tree we haven't done. So we have to go down to Fibonacci of 3 to do it. Because Fibonacci of 5 is equal to Fibonacci of 4 plus Fibonacci of 3. So all that work we just did, all these calls, all this math we just did, we just did this part. We just did the 3. So now we have to do Fibonacci of 3. So now if we go down to Fibonacci of 3, we know that's Fibonacci of 2 plus Fibonacci of 1. We got to go down Fibonacci of 2 first. And then Fibonacci of 2 splits off into Fibonacci of 1 and Fibonacci of um, 0. So we got to do Fibonacci of 1 first. That's going to be equal to 1 because that's a known, that's a constant. We go back up. And now we got to do the, the other one. So Fibonacci of 0, we know that's 0. And now we can go back up. And now Fibonacci of 2 is just 1 plus 0, so that is 1. And now we can go back up, and we can we know that Fibonacci of 3 is 2 plus 1. We still have to, Fibonacci of 2 plus Fibonacci of 1, we still have to do the Fibonacci of 1. So we go down to Fibonacci of 1, you know, we know that Fibonacci of 1 is 1. So we have that one done, and now we go back up to Fibonacci of 3. And that's going to be 1 plus 1, so that's going to be 2. And then now we have both sides of the Fibonacci of 5. So this goes back up and Fibonacci of 5 is just, you know, 5. Easy peasy, right? Well, we just did a lot of work. And we did a lot of work repeatedly. Like we did Fibonacci of 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times. We did Fibonacci of 0, 1, 2, 3 three times we did Fibonacci of two one two three times like we did so much repeated work here that 
you start to see that sometimes recursion might not be the best solution, but we'll go into that a bit later. Now, when you're doing recursive functions, you must have a very good understanding of what problem you're trying to solve. So it's always really good to do like a tree like this. Sometimes it won't be trees. Sometimes it'll be like just simple factorials. Like if we had a one for factorial, it would just be like, you know, factorial of five. Well, that's just, you know, factorial of four. And then that's just factorial of three. Sometimes it'll be just kind of like a, like a, like a straight line. It won't be a tree. So depending on how your recursive works, your recursive structure is going to look different, but it's always very useful to, to write down a recursive structure to make sure you have a very good understanding of how, of what the problem looks like. And you can make sure that your solution is actually, you know, solving it the way you expect it to be solved. All right, so now let's do another recursive application. Let's do a recursive application on list. Now, list lend themselves very well to recursive applications. You can implement really cool algorithms, really cool um, functionality by using recursion on list. So that's what we're gonna do right now. All right, so this is a bit tricky. So let's let's try to do this one together. I'm gonna write a recursive print list function. Now you're more than free to try to do this yourself first, but um, it's completely fine if you get stuck because this one's a bit tricky. There's a bit you you have to have a pretty good understanding of how list works and recursion work in order to be able to implement this. Um, but feel free to try it now. But don't get discouraged or anything if you if you if you struggle or if you run into any issues. All right, so let's start writing the function now. Let's call the function print list rec. And it's going to take in a list called my list. Now, if we're printing out a list, there's there's a couple of things we have to keep in mind. So let's say we have a list like this. Let's say we have a list that's um one, two, three. If that we have that list, we want to you know print out one, then two, then three. Um, if we have an empty list, we just don't print anything out. So when we're printing out a list what we really want to do is we want to print out the first thing in the list and then print out the rest right we print out stuff one at a time so really what we do is we print out the first thing and then we just print out the rest later right is this looking familiar and then we just keep repeating that until there's nothing left to print until we get to an empty list. So this is a bit of a hint. This means that our base case is then going to be just the empty list. So let's just write that down. So let's write, you know, if, um, you know, well, not if there, let's just write base case. If my list is an empty list, then we just return. There's nothing to do. Otherwise, we're going to want to do some stuff. I'm going to take out the first element of the list, you know, that's at index zero, and I'm just going to put it in um, in head. And then I'm going to make a separate list called rest of list, and I'm just going to put in the rest of the list. Oh, let me, I got to do this. My list, sorry about that. And then the rest of the list goes in there. Now, I have the head, which is the first one up in the list, and then I have everything else in the list. So now I could just, you know, print the um, the head of the list. So let's just do that, print head. And then we can print the rest of the list out by calling our recursive function on rest of list, and then we just return. So this is a, a, f a function in which we aren't returning a recursive call. You don't strictly have to return recursive calls. Now, recursive functions usually do, but they don't have to, as you can see here. Now, let's see if this even works. Let's see if I made a mistake somewhere. Let's make a, a, a list that is just uh, one, two, three, four, five. Just a list of numbers, and let's call this cool list. And then let's just call our function and let's see what happens. Okay, so it worked, that's good. So now let's make an empty list and see what happens when we call it with an empty list. 
So yeah, nothing happened as expected. Now let's see what happens when we call it with a list with just some one thing in it. Yeah, okay, so it's behaving as expected. Now, here's the thing. How can we change this? So instead of printing it in order, it prints it backwards. Do you have any idea what that might be? Oh, let me comment this here. Recursive, oh, recursive call. Now before we 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 solve that question, let's look at let's look at this real quick. So what we did first, we we went in, we checked if we were at our base case, if the list was empty, and if it's empty, we don't print anything. We're just done. We took the current um value, and then we split off the list. So we have the 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 first value of the list here, and then the rest of it we just put it in its own list. So that's what we did here: head and then rest of the list. There we're printing out the head, and then we're doing a recursive call with the rest of the list. Now, that problem where we have to print everything backwards, that sounds kind of hard, right? Because we would have to figure out a way to get the last element in the list and split off only the beginning of the list. Well, what if I told you we didn't have to do that? We could implement that functionality by not even rewriting any code here, but changing the order of this li of these lines. If I print after my recursive call, look what happens. Now we're printing backwards. Because we're getting to the end of the list first, and then as we exit out of these recursive calls, we then start printing. So let's say we have this same list, so we go into one, we take out one, we split off the rest of the list, then we do a recursive call. So then we take out two, and then we, we split off the rest of the list, and then we do a recursive call. So then we take out three, and then split off the rest of the list, and do a recursive call. So then we take out four, and then um, split off the rest of the list, which is just five, and do a recursive call. So then we split off five, and split off the rest of the list, which is just the empty list, and do a recursive call. However, at this point, we just have a rec an, an empty list. So this returns, and the next thing up is going to be the 5. The 5 is going to be printed now. And then that's done, so now the 4 is up, so the 4 is printed. And then we return back, and now 3, then 2, then 1. So we're working our way back now. But if we have our print before the recursive call, we first print, and then we do everything else. So the really cool thing about recursion is you can change the order of the way you're doing things just by moving lines around, which is pretty interesting. Now this doesn't apply to everything, but it applies very easily to a lot of interesting list stuff. Now this is a simpler list application. Lists lend themselves very nicely to a bunch of really cool stuff. Um, there's a bunch of cool algorithms you can implement, but I don't want to get into that. We'll probably get into those next lecture. So you can see some really interesting applications of recursion in lists. All right, so here on screen is the print list function um, in case you want to reference it later on. Um, I didn't explain earlier as I was coding what this operator was. So let me go over it again. What this does is that it starts at index one and then it just goes all the way to the end. So one, two, and then colon and then no other number just looks at the first index and then the rest of it. Whereas if we did one colon three, we would only look at ind indices one, two, and three. But this is just an easy way to split off a list into the head and into the rest of the list, which is a very useful thing in computer science. All right, so let's do another um, list recursion application. Let's do a, a function that counts up all of the even numbers in a list and it does it recursively. Now I for this one I really want you to challenge yourself and try to do this one. Um, so yeah pause the video try to do this and then come back. Um, I really believe you can do this based on the earlier parts of this lecture but if you're still a bit confused about recursion, which is perfectly natural, then you know don't feel overwhelmed, don't feel stressed about it, it's completely fine. Everyone you know, gets recursion at different paces, but I promise you that everyone gets it eventually. And once it clicks, it clicks forever. And all solutions just make more sense recursively. So um, yeah, pause the video, try it, and if um, you run into any issues, then come back to the video and then we can go over my solution. 
All right, so let's start coding up our even counter function. So let's just call it even counter. And then it takes in a list. Let's just call it my list again. Oh. Now, base case is going to be the same. When you do recursion recursion on a list, you end up with usually very similar base cases. You're always going to usually have a base case where you check if you have an empty list. That's just part of how list recursion end up, ends up being. And if you have an empty list, though, you're going to want to return a zero because in an empty list, there aren't any, any even numbers, right? So let's just return a zero. However, now we have to really do some calculations and comparisons here. Now, let's just do the same thing we did earlier where we took off the head, you know, the first number, and then we split off the rest of the list. So now let's do that, and then we do one. You know, this is just the rest of the list. That's just all that means. And now we're gonna start doing our rec our recursive calls. So let's me let me comment this here. Let's say recursive calls. Now, if head um, is divisible by two, that means it is um, even. So we have to add one to our count. And then we do even counter rest of list. Um, if that's not true, then we return zero plus even counter rest of list. Now, the reason we do this, the even counter rest of list, the zero and the one plus even counter rest of list, I mean, is that if I found um, an even number, I want to add one. You know, if we added one to our count. And then as this goes through the list, it's going to, you know, add them up. So when we go to the first index, that's not even, so that's zero. So we add zero to our total. Um, two is an, um, is an even number, so we add one when we reach it. Three is not. Four is one, so we add one again, so we have a total of two. And then we get to five, that is an even, so we add zero, so we end up with a total of two. So let's see if that actually works. Let me make sure I didn't make any mistake. Um, okay, I mean, that looks like it makes sense. So let's print. All right. That looks about right. Oh, I don't need that many parens. All right, let's see if that works. And yeah, that works. So if we had a six and an eight and a 10, that's gonna be one, two, three, four, five. Um, yeah, and we got that. So this can be very easily changed to an odd counter if you want, um, just by flipping the logic here. So I think that'd be a, a good exercise for you to do. Um, and this can also be changed so you can count up how many um, numbers in a list are divisible by another number. I could change this so that it is like, and then I have n here, and then I can make it so it counts up how many of the numbers in that list are divisible by n. That'd be a pretty cool exercise you guys could do. But that is simply how you make an even counter using recursion on lists. All right, so on screen, I have the recursive even counter code for future reference. Um, clean it up a little bit so it's a bit more condensed, but it's still the same logic. So now the, the question really is, is recursion always better? And the answer is a flat, not always. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, but it really depends on a lot of different factors. It depends on the kind of problem you're trying to solve in the environment in which you're trying to solve it. It depends on the restraints that you have. For example, if you're running this on a calculator versus if you're running this on a supercomputer, that kind of thing. Um, but the, the, the really important thing here is that every single recursive solution can be implemented in an iterative way. Iterative just means that you're using loops. You guys remember how we did the factorial, right? Where we did the loops, that would have been the iterative solution. And the recursive calls would have been the recursive solution. Now, the main problem with recursion is that if you have too many recursive calls, that could lead to issues as we saw earlier. You can't go more than around a thousand layers deep in Python. And you run into issues when you are doing too complex recursive calls as well. So while it is a very powerful tool and a really cool one, you know, it, it really feels like you're doing magic because you're really, you know, solving really complex problems in very few lines. It's still not the only tool you should have in your toolbox. Um, and like a toolbox, 
there is no best tool. There's a best tool for a job, but there's no best overall tool. So you should always be competent. You should always be skilled in all the tools in your toolbox. All right, so we're back in the code because I want to show you guys the difference between iterative and um, recursive. So I found this iterative solution online for Fibonacci, and then we have our earlier recursive solution. Now, the uh, iterative solution works just fine, um, and I also wrote this function here that's going to print out the Fibonacci sequence up to the nth number. So if I call that function with 5, let me run it, it's going to print out the first 5 Fibonacci numbers. And depending on which line is commented out, it's going to be which one we're, we're printing out. So now we're running it with the iterative Fibonacci, and we get the exact same results. Now let's say we want to print out to the 10th Fibonacci number. Let's do the iterative first. And yeah, we get it, and that's just fine. And now if we go with the recursive one, we get it as well. Same exact solution. And let's say you want to go oh, to 25th. And let's do the iterative one first. Yep, that, sound, that looks good to me. And now let's do the recursive one. Okay, looking good. Now let's say we want to get up to the 35th um, Fibonacci sequence. Um, let's do the iterative one first. And then let's run that. Okay, we got that. Let's compare it to our recursive function. And you'll notice that the recursive function is starting to slow down. We still got the same number, 50. 570, 570, 2887, 2887, but the recursive one was slower. That was kind of weird. Let's um let's increase the number. Let's add let's go up to 50. Go up to 50 with our iterative solution. And that's instant. Now let's go up to 50 in our recursive solution. And it starts to slow down to a crawl. And it's it's gonna get to 50, but it's taking a very long time. Uh, my computer's um, fans just start to rev up because the CPU is under a lot more load now because it's trying to get through as fast as possible. Like my computer isn't frozen or anything, but it's still, you know, this is still taking a significant amount of time, and it's taking around double what each one took earlier. Like we're still trying to get to 39 now. And this was much longer than it took 38 to get done. So 39 was done then. And now while we wait to 440, it'll probably take around double-ish. Not necessarily double, but a, it's, a, it's a sizable increase each time. You know, we're still not at 40. And as this keeps increasing, it's just, it's just going to take forever. But the thing is, we're not a lot of recursion calls deep. If you guys remember back to the recursive diagram we, we drew for Fibonacci, we were doing a lot of, um, you know, repeated work. And that's what's happening here. Every time we do Fibonacci of 40, we got to do Fibonacci of 39 and 38. And then when we do Fibonacci of 39, that one has to do 38 and 37. But we also have to do that 38 that's up there. So though each, so each branch of that tree has to go all the way down to the end before we can begin another branch. And then that's just extremely slow. It's not so much that your computer's slow as running through them, it's that you are giving the computer an extreme amount of work to run through. Whereas when you do an iterative solution, you just go one at a time, you save your solution, so you, do, you, you don't end up doing any redundant calculations. If I am calculating um, Fibonacci of 50, I start at Fibonacci of 1 and 2, and then I go up from there. So then I add three to it, and then you know I add those two, and I get the third one, then I add those two, and I get the fourth one. As you can see, we just keep track of the last two Fibonacci numbers, and we know what the first two always are. Here they have it, so it's the first three, but it's pretty much the same thing. Um, and even though I was talking there for quite some time, we're still at just Fibonacci of 41. Now, now that you're going to start writing recursive solutions, um, there's a little trick um, that you could do to stop um, when it, whenever a program goes like this. You know, they're just taking way longer than you expect. Um, depending on what you're using um, is the 
exact code, but if you do if you click on the console and you do control Z, it just stops the program from running. I believe this works on Ripple. You click on the console, do control Z, and then I believe it also works on idle as well. But with idle, you can just close the execution window and it'll stop as well. Now, with the um iterative solution, we could give some bonker numbers. Like we could give like let's go up to a hundred. Oh, not there, of course. Silly me. We go up to a hundred and it's instant. Go up to a thousand and it's instant. Those numbers are big, but it's pretty instant still. If we were to do that with, you know, our recursive call, eh, it's not going to work out. And even then, we might run into issues when we start getting up to a thousand because when we get to a thousand, we may reach that 1000 recursion depth limit and that's going to error out automatically. And the problem is this won't error out until we're at the thousandth term or close to it. So that's going to take hours, days. This could take weeks to get to that. It doesn't matter if you have a top of the line com computer with a super overclocked CPU. This will still take forever because you are giving it an unreasonable amount of work. The computer has to go through that tree that we drew earlier for Fibonacci of 5. And that took us forever. Just 5. Now the computer will do it pretty quick. But us doing that tree of Fibonacci of 5 is the equivalent of, you know, the computer trying to do Fibonacci of 40 right now. So imagine how long it would take the computer to do Fibonacci of a thousand, which is pretty, it's pretty wild. Now, the really cool thing about this is you can like graph the difference between it, an iterative Fibonacci and a recursive Fibonacci. You could do a test of Fibonacci up to like 50 and time how long it takes each Fibonacci digit to be calculated. And you can graph that and you could show a relationship of how long Fibonacci takes recursively versus iteratively compared to how many digits you want to calculate. That's a pretty cool project you could do and it'd be pretty interesting. And Python also has some really cool graphing stuff that you could use so that it just does all of this automatically for you. It, um, it graphs everything, it times everything, it stores everything, and then it just shows you the final result. So that's something really neat you could do. And the way you can learn how to do that would just be to Google all that stuff. Google how to do graphs in Python, how to do timers in Python, and, you know, how to, um, just how to do stuff like that. And that's super cool. That's super interesting stuff. That's a really interesting, you know, really, really cool stuff about Python that you could just Google pretty much anything and you're going to learn a lot of really cool stuff. Um, even while I went down that mini rant, we're still at 41. We haven't, we still haven't even gotten to 42 yet. And we're supposed to get up to a thousand. So there's just no way we're going to get to a thousand in a reasonable amount of time. We are still not in 42. But looking at the code, the, the Fibonacci recursive solution is very elegant, very easy, follows the definition very clearly. This one, it kind of does as well, but it's more mechanical. You have to run through it. You have to think about it a bit more. But the recursive one, you just pretty much copy the definition. Again, the benefit is that for this one, you're not doing that big tree with it earlier. You're just keeping track of the, the previous two Fibonacci numbers and working your way up to the Fibonacci solution. Here, we're starting at where we want to be, and then we're building the foundation under us. But doing that, you end up doing a bunch of recursive calls that are redundant. And there's ways around this, but that's a bit outside of the scope of this class. If you're interested in learning how you could do that, it's something called memoization. It would be kind of like combining these two terms. It would make it memoization is a type of, you know, problem solving with recursion where you save the uh, every single computation you do. And that way, every time you're going to do a computation, you check first if you have it. And if you do have it, you don't redo the calculation. You just have it already saved. So you just get it from where you have it saved. So it's a pretty interesting topic, but it's outside of the scope of this class. If you want to look it up, please feel free to. It's very interesting, but you're not going to be tested on that or anything like that. No assignment will use that. But the concept's called memoization, and it's still a pretty worthwhile topic to look at. Let's see, we're still at 42. Wow. Uh, but yeah, this, this would take days, even weeks to get to a thousand. And even then we'll probably wouldn't even get to a thousand. We'll probably error out because we went in too deep in terms of the recursion calls. 
But yeah, that, that's, I just wanted to show you guys a really quick um, look at the main difference between these. Now, if the thing is, the iterative one is not strictly better. Because if we were sticking to, sticking like to small numbers, if we could guarantee that we will only be asked up to 30, these would be identical. If code size matters, this has less lines. If I want this to be very readable, this is much more readable. But in terms of performance which with large numbers, this is clearly superior. This did a thousand in the time it took this one to do like 10. Like there, there's just no competition there. But yeah, so we got to 43. I'll just leave this running, you know, just forever. And eventually it'll get there. Um, but I want to use my computer for other stuff, so I'll just cancel it. And that's just control Z. Just in Visual Studio Code, it's control Z. Oh, you got to be clicking the the thing. So control Z and that um, does it for you. And yeah, so that's the, the main difference between recursion and um, iterative solutions and, you know, some issues you may run into if you use a recursive solution when you shouldn't have used a recursive solution. So in conclusion, recursion is just a function that calls itself. That's all it is. In programming, it's just a function that calls itself. There's a much nicer formal mathematical definition, but we're not going to worry about that too much. In programming, recursion is just when something calls itself. Now, all recursive functions must have at least one base case and at least one recursive call. You need at least one of each. You can have 20 recursive calls if you want. You know, maybe you want to do slightly different stuff for different cases. You can have 20 different base cases if you want. That's fine, but you must make sure you have a minimum of one base case and one recursive call in there, and they must be useful. You must make sure you always update your parameters every time. Now, recursion is extremely easy once you understand it. Now, understanding it can be a bit tricky, but once you get it, you are never going to forget it. You're going to be thinking up recursive solutions in your sleep. It's it's just super intuitive. Understanding it, however, it's a bit tricky, so it's completely fine And if after your first viewing of this video you still don't get it. Please rewatch this video again and look up recursive um, you know, videos on YouTube look up like recursive program in C or recursion in Python or recursive solution in Java. Just look up recursion in YouTube and you'll get a bunch of different videos explaining recursion in different ways. And maybe those ways will work better for you. Now, the very important thing about recursion is you must practice, practice, practice. The way you understand recursion is by doing recursion. So I hope you were coding along with all the vid with all the code you saw during this video. And if you didn't, no big deal. Just rewatch this video again and just code along. Change the functions a little bit. Write your own functions for recursion just to see, you know, how how you could implement it. Look up recursive problems that you could try solving. I recommend Googling something like sim intro recursive problems. And that should give you really nice um really nice problems you can solve through and these websites they just they also have the solution for this so you can compare your solution to their solution so you can learn but recursion more so than anything in programming requires practice once you have it you got it it's you can't forget it it's gonna it's more intuitive than an iterative solution it just makes more sense once you were once you have a lot of programming experience under your belt you'll notice that you get to the recursive solution first and then usually you have to figure out how to turn it into an iterative solution but that's you know you guys still aren't there yet and that's completely fine but i promise you will get there and that's pretty much recursion next week um next lecture if we're going to go into recursion again and we'll take a much deeper dive we'll look into much more complex problems um and it'll get a lot more interesting once you see how, how truly powerful recursion is and how you can break down really scary complex problems into just a couple of base cases and a couple of recursive calls.